nine volunteers, seven degree water. This is Coldwater Boot Camp. Nine hardy volunteers have been selected from across the country to be subjected to icy cold water and teach them how to survive an accidental cold water immersion. The instructor for boot camp is Dr. Gordon Giesbrecht, Professor of Thermal Physiology at the University of Manitoba. Good morning, welcome to Cold Water Boot Camp. The best way to find out about cold water immersion is to get right in. So we're gonna give you your gear, I want you to go get changed, and you're all gonna go for a swim. We're gonna show you why people die in cold water, why cold water continues to take lives each and every year. You see, most people just don't understand the effects of cold water immersion, and some end up paying the ultimate price. So pay attention, this program could save your life. As our boot campers head to the water, here are a few cold hard facts. A recent study of drowning statistics by the Life Saving Society revealed that when it came to boaters, 60% drowned in water under 10 degrees, and 34% drowned in water between 10 and 20 degrees. What makes it even more chilling is the fact that 43% were less than two meters from safety. The majority, about 90%, were not wearing a life jacket. A study by the Canadian Safe Boating Council found that some people say they don't wear life jackets because they're close to shore, or that they feel they can put it on in the water if they need it. And most, well, they said they didn't need it because they could swim. Well, as our boot campers are about to find out, in this six degree water, none of those reasons are valid. One by one, our volunteers undertook their first immersion designed to gauge their response to cold water as they attempted to swim towards shore. Most experienced the typical gasp response and had to work at controlling their breathing. But eventually, cold tired muscles made swimming difficult and the rescue swimmers moved in to take them back to shore where specially equipped emergency tents were waiting. The folks who failed quickly were very interesting because because they would have drowned if they didn't have somebody to rescue them. Uh, but they weren't, again, medically hypothermic or cold. So all they had was cold muscle oh, tissue, yeah. which didn't work. And uh, as you get weaker, you fail and then you'll drown. Well, how's it going, folks? You had a great time, I had a great day. How about you? After drying off and warming up, Dr. Well, Giesbrecht we, we brought the boot campers into the classroom so where they'd learn about what just so happened just and prepare for the next challenge with valuable information about cold water immersion. I have one question. How long do you think it would take to become hypothermic in water that was the temperature out there today? We've actually done a, uh, a survey on 661 folks who come to cold-related seminars, so they're already biased a bit in that they're interested in the topic. 50% of the respondents said under five minutes, just becoming hypothermic. And, and I think, uh, like I can tell you that none of you were hypothermic today. Maybe after you got out and, you're, and when you started really shivering, that was because your core temperature had an after drop, you might have might have dropped a degree or two, but while you're in there, probably not at all. And basically, but uh, if you go on here, like if you add that, 70% of the people who responded said 10 minutes or less. And uh, this little block here is important because that's the right answer. It's, it's a half an hour or more. And only about 5% of the people, no matter who you ask, whether they're blue collar, white collar workers, medical professionals, uh, rescue workers, uh, very few people really understand that. And as we go through the rest of this hour, it'll, be, uh, it'll become real clear why that's an important point to know. So if you look at this graph, this is kind of core temperature. The, the, red, the red line is core temperature. Uh, here's normal 37 to 35, down to 25 over time. This is in, in really, really cold water, ice water, or maybe five degrees. And you can see that uh, if, uh, if you, you're in the water, the temperature, of course, will drop. And around 30 degrees Celsius core temperature is when you stop shivering. And most of you are shivering pretty intently today. But uh, just losing consciousness is not what causes you to die from hypothermia. It's cardiac arrest. And the, and the heart temperature has to get down around 25 to 28 degrees before the heart will actually stop. So we devised a way to, to remember all three phases and to remember this graph with what we call the 110-1 principle. 
And the first thing, of course, is do not panic because you have one minute to get your breathing under control. You have 10 minutes of meaningful movement and one hour before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. Now this is in ice water, so if it's five degrees like you're in today, these numbers will be a little bit longer. But the point is you actually can survive a long time in cold water if you had a PFD on. So the 1101 principle, the first part of that is you have one minute to get your breathing under control. So regarding the cold shock responses, consider these following things. First of all, do not panic. And the other thing is focus on surviving the first minute by getting control of your breathing. So the second effect, cold incapacitation. It's just muscle and nerve cells, as they get colder, they work less and less. And once that happens, you need to prepare for the eventuality that you will not be able to do anything for yourself. So how can you minimize cold incapacitation? Obviously, don't fall in the water. Get out of the water as quickly as you can if you are in there. Uh, if you can't, then you want to get as much of your body out of the water as possible, like, like holding on to an overturned boat or, or sitting in an upright boat. That even if it's underwater, it can still keep much of your body out of the water if you're sitting on there. Uh, maybe you uh, would want to attach yourself to something that is floating, whatever, because as you get colder, you will get weaker and eventually you won't be able to do anything. Now, if you survive the immediate short term and, and uh, midterm phases, cold shock response, cold incapacitation, and you've not been rescued, but you're able to keep your head above water, you have a life jacket on, then you'll enter the third phase, which is hypothermia. And again, we said that takes at least 30 minutes to maybe an hour even in cold, ice cold water. An excuse many people use for not wearing a life jacket is if they ever ended up in the water, they could put one on. So we had all of our campers try that. And uh, although they all did get it on, they all, it was difficult for all of them. Today we had our campers do several tests. Uh, some of them are speed of movement tests, strength tests, reboarding a boat, and working a radio. And uh, they all did it fairly well at the beginning. And then we did it again 20 and some of them 40 minutes later. And they were all pretty well able to do it, but they all commented and you could see very obviously that it was belabored movement, it was slower, and uh, they, just, they just had a difficult time. And it, in, indeed, a couple of the campers were not able to get into the boat. Two of our volunteers, Eric and Antoine, remained in the cold water to experience mild hypothermia. And after about an hour, the signs were clear and rescue teams swung into action. Eric had spent almost one hour in the water, and when he was finally returned to the dock, the temperature telemetry pill that Eric swallowed before his immersion showed a core temperature drop of just over one degree Celsius. Eric was packed and taken to the rewarming tent to join his hypothermic partner, Antoine. After 53 minutes in the water, Antoine's slimmer body mass experienced a greater drop of about two and a half degrees Celsius during his swim. We did another interesting comparison today. We took Ryan, and Chris and Alice out and Chris and Alice wore life jackets and Ryan didn't and they kind of swam together. Ryan started off stronger than his first swim with Alice and Chris in their life jackets following closely behind. But after a short time it became obvious that Ryan was weakening rapidly and he was rescued from the six degree water. Alice was still floating but unable to go any further and gladly return to the boats. However, the point was made that with flotation, she would have been able to survive much longer through to unconsciousness from hypothermia and eventual rescue. In contrast to his first two and a half minute swim, Chris was able to control his breathing and swim confidently towards shore, covering quite a distance in the 23 minutes before being brought aboard. I think cold water boot camp has really demonstrated the three phases of cold water immersion. We saw lots of the cold shock, we saw lots of cold incapacitation, and we had two people go to hypothermia. And it took a long time to get them hypothermic. So it kind of just reinforces the one ten one principle. You have one minute to get your breathing under control. Do not panic. You have 
10 minutes or maybe 20 in this kind of water of meaningful movement. And then you have an hour, or in this case, maybe two hours before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. And of course, you only get to that point if you have a life jacket on. If you don't have flotation, then you will definitely die in the first two phases. But when you do that, you'll be perfectly normal thermic. I'm gonna share my story for sure uh, and uh, emphasize with family, friends, and colleagues. If they experienced what I experienced this weekend, they would never, ever, ever think twice. Never think twice about wearing their life jacket. Wear your life jacket. Don't go boating alone. Uh, don't go anywhere near cold water alone for that matter. And just try to prepare for whatever's gonna happen, because it could happen. When it comes to cold water, preparation and prevention are the keys. Try to prevent falling into cold water, but prepare in case you do with simple things like knowing how to rescue yourself or how to call for help. Knowing what to do in those first few critical minutes can mean the difference between you becoming a statistic or a survivor. And the message, well, it's clear. No matter your age, level of fitness, or ability to swim, the best way to stay safe on the water, any water, is to wear your life jacket.